Andrews. Whew, I'm hot walking down the stairs. So I hope that you're will be cool in here. It's great. I'm so pleased that this church has air conditioning. Um, anyway, welcome to you all, and especially to those who are worshiping with us at a distance. We're glad to have you join us. Um, we're also glad today to see a few faces that haven't been here for a while who are coming back, creeping out of COVID conditions into the sanctuary. It's lovely to see you. And we have a, another guest today that, if you read your newsletter this last week from St. Andrews, you will know who I'm maybe going to talk to about. And that's this character over in the corner called Matt Vizzaria. Matt Vizzaria. That's a really Presbyterian name, Vizzaria. It's an Italian name, I think, from Thoreau. So you're going to, if Matt's going to join us and we'll have a little chat later on. But welcome to that. Um, and the legend should just add this. That Matt is currently studying at Knox College. He's a candidate for ministry from the Presbytery of Niagara. And he's going to be joining us uh, for the year uh, here at um, St. Andrews to learn how to be a minister. <laughs> that's what, that's, oh dear. <laughs> I'm going to behave myself. <laughs> um, and it, we can see that. Um, most of the announcements are left to read for yourselves. Obviously, COVID restrictions are still in place. Some every week they seem to change a little bit, and we hope that in another few weeks they might even change a little bit more. Get rid of the masks. But, um, Mr. Ford, if you're listening, we'd like to get rid of the masks. Um, this is not on. Oh. It was last week. There's something wrong with me, I think, because. It's just Things don't work. Oh well. Let's try. That wasn't a that wasn't. It was red. Yeah. It switches out. Oh. 
As we're <laughs> um, we hope that restrictions will be lifted before too long. At any rate, we're here. You're masked, but you are allowed to sing behind you. Okay, thank you. Um, if you are unable or not quite ready to come back to worship at present, this is for the folks listening at a distance. Of course, the webs uh, go to our website and you'll find St. Andrews. You'll also find a link to Facebook for St. Andrews or YouTube for St. Andrews where the service is uh, uh, online as well. Um, as I mentioned, the St. Andrews Summer Newsletter was sent out this week uh, electronically to all of you who have um, email addresses. If you have one and would like to take one with you, perhaps to someone who doesn't have uh, an email address, uh, please, there are some on either table going out the doors, another uh, 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 extra copies of that newsletter. Today, I'm delighted to say that after worship, you're going to have some lemonade in the lawn. So there's a table out there. Jane is going to serve it. She's over in the kitchen preparing it right now, which is great. And so thank you to Jane and to Julie for getting that set up for us. So please, have, you'll have a chance to socially distance and uh, drink to your heart's content. Make a drink lemonade. Um, one more thing. During the month of August, as you already know, we're going to have August gatherings for Gatto and Grace. Every Wednesday night, uh, during August, so at 7 o'clock we're going to meet outside, hopefully, for the gatto, and then come inside for grace. And James is going to play, there's going to be musical instruments each week, a different instrument, and then I'll say a few words about grace, but I hope that you'll boom into those, August the 4th, 11th, 18th, and 25th, and invite friends to come with you. I think those are all of our announcements. Let's um, take a moment to Anticipate that God will meet us as we come to meet with him. Hello. Our call to worship. The Lord is gracious and merciful, slow to anger, and abounding in steadfast love. Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised. And we do praise God in our opening hymn, 313, for worship the King.
Now, it's so lovely to have you here. I just should say this. I met Matt a year or two ago, two years ago, at the presbytery. Matt was presented to the presbytery as a possible candidate by the session of Chilmerwood Church, which I used to be minister of years ago, but before Matt went there. And we interviewed Matt, and the three of us interviewed him thought he was just such a fine guy. Well, he's finished one whole year at Knox College, 10 courses, that's a full load. I think you said one, only one mark below the figure of 80, which is amazing. And he's just either, oh, just finished a summer course in Greek. This guy is serious about what he's doing. So here he is. Now, just tell us a little bit about your growing up and how you got to Chippewa. Yeah, sounds great. Uh, so, first off, it's wonderful to be here. Um, I've probably driven past this church hundreds of times. I've been, been in the area my whole life, and uh, I always thought it was so beautiful from the outside. And uh, I'm really excited over the next eight or nine months to uh, learn and, and see the, the beauty of the people on the inside as well. So uh, I'm really looking forward to that. So uh, like I said, I, I was born and I grew up in Thoral. Uh, as you can tell by my last name, I grew up Roman Catholic. Uh, I was an altar boy before school, Italian mass, the whole deal of my... Grandmother was, I, she was more proud than all of her friends because her grandson was the altar boy. So, um, but as I grew up and I grew older and became, you know, a rebellious teenager, um, I questioned everything and uh, a lot of what I questioned um, was with my, not with my faith, but more with the, uh, the rules and regulations probably of, of the Catholic Church. And so um, I never strayed from my faith, but I definitely strayed from attending church. 
Um, and then I met my wife, who, well, she would be my wife, but uh, she made it very clear how important her faith was to her. And so uh, after our first date together, um, I, we wanted to see each other right away afterwards. And so she invited me to Bible study at her Presbyterian church, which was in Buffalo. My wife's American. And uh, I agreed in a moment of passion and then on the drive home realized, what the heck did I just agree to? <laughs> um, and so in my naivete, I you know, figured, well, I'm going to a Bible study. I, I better have a Bible. Not, not assuming that going to a Bible study at a church would be a lot of Bibles there. So uh, I was the one in the Bible study where you heard the big crack of the stem because I had to go buy a brand new one. Um, but uh, I started going back to church mostly to impress this new girl. But uh, once I was there and, uh, you know, heard a different um, angle on, on scripture and a different approach where, you know, you have a minister who really is there to build relationships with the congregation, which I had never seen before the way I grew up. And uh, a guy my age, and we went out and had a beer together, and we liked hockey, and, you know, so it just really changed, and I started going to church um, for me, not just to impress um, this girl who fortunately became my wife. But uh, when we moved this way, uh, we moved to Niagara Falls, which is where we live now, and uh, we wanted to stay in the Presbyterian tradition, and uh, Chippewa was close to where we lived, and uh, we went and uh, really enjoyed the, the people there. Um, great program for kids because we had a little one at the time, and uh, now she's eight, and she's as excited to go to church as we are, so uh, that's where I've been. We've been there for approximately about eight years. So, so Matt, that's one thing. Uh, going to a Presbyterian church to meet your wife or to meet this girl. <laughs> but why the heck are you becoming a Presbyterian minister? Where does that come from? That's, that's a really, really good question, and to be perfectly honest with you, I fought it as hard as I possibly could. Um, this was not a, boy, that would be cool, kind of thing. Um, I, you know, my, my family has a business in the area, and it's been growing, and I've been there for a long time, and you know, always had this idea of kind of taking it over one day. Um, but uh, as I got more and more involved in my church, you know, it was uh, my minister who kind of tapped me on the shoulder at the beginning and asked to, you know, be involved in Bible study. And once I did that, you know, it, it just, um, you know, I started to hear a little kind of a tap on the shoulder. And then, uh, you know, I had the opportunity to run uh, a workshop. We did a workshop on Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis. And doing that, you know, the tap kind of got louder. And then my minister asked me to preach one Sunday. And that's where, you know, the tap became like a woodpecker in the back of my head. And uh, I, I promise you I fought as hard as I could. And I put up every obstacle and roadblock to answering that call from God. Um, and then finally I realized that every obstacle that was there, I had put in place. And uh, God kept showing me signs that this is what uh, my purpose was. And, uh, you know, I think we all have that call. Uh, not the call to be, you know, ministers, but, uh, you know, I think God is tapping on all of our shoulders in some form. And, uh, you know, the choice is ours whether to recognize it and be aware of it and answer it or, you know, to ignore it and think that it's, you know, something else. So uh, I finally just submitted, and that was probably about two years ago. And uh, here I am. <laughs> so, uh, final question. Has everybody, has everybody ever told you what a minister does? Like, do you know what you're in for? What, what do you think a minister's for? Yeah, well, I've seen the, the you know, the, the really fancy showy part. You know, I've read you know, that worship in, you know, probably about 20 times over the past couple of years. And, you know, that's the real fun part. But, uh, you know, I, I've also uh, been at a session meeting. I'm, I'm a member of our board. And, uh, you know, I've been at a press review meeting. So I see the, uh, you know, the non flash on the, the, the other side of it. And, and the, the part that I've only had a small access to was, you know, the, the pastoral care, you know, working you know, with an individual or with a family. Uh, and that's mostly been as, as peers, you know, as people who have understood and saw that my, trans my transition um, have, have come to me more. But for me, um, kind of the metaphor, the idea that I, I have in my head of, of, of a pastor is uh, kind of that idea of the shepherd, you know. And I think that, you know, sometimes we have this idea that a shepherd is someone that corrals the sheep and, you know, gives them a whack when they get a line or a sexy dog on them or anything like that. But, you know, if, if we look at the, the metaphor of 
shepherd in all the scriptures, it's always about caring for the flock and putting the flock before the shepherd and, and, and leaving the flock to go and find that one, you know, sheep where, you know, that is lost and is straight. And, you know, you see that in Saul's, you see that in a lot of the parables. Um, so for me, that idea is uh, of the shepherd is to lift up and empower the flock. Um, just like my minister lifted me up and empowered me, and you know, I, I don't, I, I've asked him, I'm still friends with him, obviously, today. And, you know, he, he had, in that one city, he ever come to me and say, I knew you were going to be a minister. Um, he just saw something in me, just like the shepherd sees something in, in not only the strength of the flock, but each individual sheep in that flock. And uh, just encouraged me to, to be aware, and encouraged me to serve God in the way that, you know, you know, I'm, I'm, whether you're a hammer, whether you're a wrench, whatever the tool is you're here, and you do what you do, what you do. Uh, a, a hammer will never help you with a screw. Uh, but it, 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 it's, you know, we're all here for our own purpose and to serve God in our way. And I think that's the best way that you can be um, individually and as a group, you know, be in you know, this, you know, God's service and God's service. Matt, Matt. I should touch my position. I can see here.
revealing Jesus doing exactly that. He had compassion. What we just read in Matthew chapter 9 tells how Jesus met a series of needy people. One of them was a synagogue leader who asked Jesus to come and provide his dying daughter. On his way to help her, Jesus became aware of another person in the crowd, another needy person, a woman who had been plagued by for 12 years by bleeding. He believed that Jesus could heal her if she could only touch his clothing. Never content to be an impersonal healer, Jesus wanted to meet that woman face to face. She, embarrassed by her problem, a problem by the way which would have made her an outcast from the synagogue, shied away from Jesus. But he didn't shy away from her. He went to her and said, take heart, daughter. Take heart. Your faith has healed you. We all, we all need compassion. We all have different reasons for needing them. We do. We all need compassion. Especially if, as with Jesus' compassion, it gives us the gift of real help. I often, over the years, have heard people talk about our health system, of which we make huge demands, and which, for the most part, responds well. But what's sometimes missing in our health system is compassion. When we're ill, we want medical intervention, but we also want compassion. Without it, we may get fixed, but we may not get healed. I remember a few years ago talking to a social worker about how those living in group homes because of their mental disability were treated. And she told me that Ontario's guidelines discourage caregivers from, from giving any physical affection. And of course we understand immediately what prompts such guidelines, and yet they seem to rule out, diminish the capacity for compassion. Jesus had compassion, not only for a synagogue leader, but for a synagogue outcast. But also, says Matthew 9, verse 36, for the crowds of harassed, helpless people whom Jesus called sheep without a shepherd. He was moved. He was obviously moved not just by physical suffering, but by crowds of people around him who had really no clue how God loved them and valued them, the very least of them. Which makes me think this, the next time you walk or I walk through Walmart looking for a bargain, look too for the, look at the faces around you. They, those folk, those faces God loves. If Jesus' compassion had breadth, it also had depth. For he addressed not only physical needs like leprosy or blindness, but he, Jesus relates with compassion to a whole range of things that trouble us and that weary us and that weigh down our lives. In the chapter before, in Matthew, before the one we read, Matthew quotes the words of I, the famous words of Isaiah 53 and, and applies them to Jesus. And Matthew chapter 8 says that Jesus took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. It's a wonderful line. A wonderful line. Jesus took up our infirmities and carried our sorrows. That's compassion. He took on our needs and infirmities. He was afflicted for us. Throughout his life, and especially at his death, 
That's compassion. It's the sort of emotion that's willing to come alongside and suffer with those who are suffering. Some rich people act very generously toward those who are in need. I think, for example, of Bill Gates. He apparently has a fortune of $130 billion. I looked that up a couple of days ago. $130 billion. And he is a philanthropist of the first order. But the fact is that he remains insanely rich. Jesus, on the other hand, has a compassion so deep that he gave his whole life away. He suffered for us. Left nothing. And suffered to the point of death. To grasp the significance of Jesus' compassion, we need to place it within the Bible's larger narrative. That is, the Old Testament teaches, as we read in Psalm 103, the Old Testament teaches that God is a God of compassion. That word was used, I think, three times in our text from, from Psalm 103. But the New Testament goes completely radical about this idea of God's compassion. Because this is what it says. The New Testament makes this claim that God and God's compassion became incarnate in a flesh and blood Jesus. And that, in fact, is the claim that differentiates Christianity from all other religions. God took on flesh. God's person and God's compassion came right into our world and right into our lives. In Christ, says the New Testament, God became one of us in order to get right inside your need and mine, your suffering and mine. It's, it's a stunning play. Hebrews chapter 2 puts it like this. It says, Jesus was tested by what he suffered and so was able to, to, able to help those who are being tested. In other words, God doesn't stand at a distance from you when you suffer. God doesn't shield himself from any of us when we are in pain but comes to us in Jesus with all his unfathomable compassion to walk with us and indeed carry us through the deep waters that we sometimes find ourselves having to navigate. And that leads to another aspect of Jesus' compassion. And it's this. The emotion of compassion moved him to action. During the course of the COVID pandemic, I'm sure I'm not the only one here who has stood in awe as I saw or heard about compassion that acted despite significant risk to save lives. It's restored our faith in humanity in many ways. Too, too often, however, and I speak for myself, too often, my compassion is a very temporary emotion that makes my eyes water with a little tear when I see something on television that's appealing for help. But, you know, five minutes later, I'm watching tennis or golf, and I've forgotten about it. It evaporates. Are you like that as well? Thank you all for agreeing. Makes me feel good. <laughs> Jesus' compassion, that emotion, wasn't a momentary emotion. It moved him to take action. It moved him to help that synagogue leader, to help that synagogue outcast, to help the men who were blind and the person who was mute. You see, compassion remains a self-indulgent emotion unless it leads to action. As followers of Jesus... We are called not only to feel compassion as an emotion, but then to act 
to act for the sake of others. Now, of course we cannot solve every problem of every person we meet. But neither are we to keep at arm's length. Christian compassion gets its hands dirty by moving Jesus-like alongside those who are suffering to help others carry their burdens even to the point of us in some sense suffering ourselves. What does that look like in practice? Well, I thought about it like this. Compassion means that instead of telling a grieving person to cheer up, we'll set aside our dislike of listening and entering into their pain. And we will listen. And we will be pained as we listen to and enter into the anguish of another human soul. Do you understand what I'm saying? Sometimes people say, cheer up, because they don't want to, they don't want to get anywhere close to the pain of loss. That's compassion. Compassion means that instead of telling someone who is suffering from depression to just get over it, Instead, we'll take the time to accompany that person through the darkness that has descended on their life, just sitting there perhaps without even speaking a word. That's compassion. Compassion means that instead of feeling smug or superior, when a friend of yours tells you somehow that they've had some big moral failure in their life, Instead, you or I will be prepared to walk with them and to support them and to take them in all their neediness in prayer to Jesus and at the same time to humbly acknowledge that there, but, but for the grace of God, there go I. Does that make sense? That's compassion. Now the interesting thing is that compassion was not just at the center of Jesus' life, but it was at the center of the life of the church of the next number of generations that followed Jesus. Such that historians of the early church, 1st, 2nd, 3rd century, often name compassion as the key reason why that early church went from a little tiny group in Jerusalem to a worldwide movement. What was the key? For the historians, they say over and over, the church's compassion. At the time, at the time, Christians were suspected and indeed persecuted by the Roman Empire. Nevertheless, the people of that empire watched these strange people called Christians over and over pick children out of the city dumps and nurse them back to health. People of the empire watched in generation after generation when plagues came. They watched the Christians go and look after those who died with plague, putting their own lives at risk. Compassion. In Canada in 2021, we are not Praise God, being persecuted as Christians. No, no. And yet, we are often suspect. Here's my suggestion. How do we respond to that? Christians in many ways in Canada have been pushed to the side. How do we respond to that? We could respond by retreating behind our locked up doors. Or we become belligerent and angry. Here's my suggestion, that as a congregation, we at St. Andrews simply decide to become known in this town as a community that loves Jesus and is willing to act with Jesus' compassion to all those we meet, giving people a glimpse of grace and a second chance. It doesn't mean we'll approve of everything we meet, not at all. 
Now it does mean that we'll not jump to judgment or disapprove without knowing first the complex factors that lead sometimes other people to make unwise decisions. You see, Jesus' compassion embraced those who other people shunned. As Jesus would say, go and do likewise. One final note about Jesus' compassion is this. It signaled the dawning of a new age. That is, Jesus wasn't just a do-gooder who helped a leper here or a blind man there. To understand him, we need to see him as operating and working out God's great universal ultimate plan, which Jesus repeatedly called the kingdom of God. Jesus once uh, provided a clue to the meaning of that kingdom by quoting some other words from the prophet Isaiah. He stood up one day in a synagogue, this is what he said, the spirit of the Lord is upon me because he anointed me to preach good news to the poor sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favour. Now, the Jews had read those words for centuries, praying that God would finally one day come and right all of the world's wrongs. That day, is after Jesus had read those words from the prophet Isaiah, this is what he said. He read the scriptures. What comes, what come, in worship, what comes after the scriptures? Every week, what comes after the read the scriptures? Thank you. Here's, here's, that's exactly, we, we Christians copied that from the synagogue. Here's the sermon, one sentence. Jesus said, today, this scripture I've read is being fulfilled. And then he sat down. Sometimes you wish that maybe some clergy would just make it one sentence and sit down. <laughs> he did, Jesus did that day. And what he was saying was this. What you've longed to see, the day you've longed to see, when the God would come and where the poor would receive the good news of the gospel and those who are stuck would be set free and the blind given sight. Today, today it's happening. His ministry of compassion, he claimed, was evidence that God's kingdom was on its way. Now, Jesus knew then, as we know now, that Jesus' kingdom hasn't fully yet come, hasn't fully come. And until it does, Jesus sends us out as Jesus-like people into the communities in which we're set. And we are to point to that coming kingdom by our ministry of compassion. Compassion, of course, is exhausting. It's exhausting. Matt, be ready for this. It's exhausting. <laughs> In a world of crop failure, in a world of forest fires, in a world of chronic illness, in a world of intractable Middle East violence, compassion is easily swamped. And we discover that we can't fix everything. But what we are to do, like that, remember the little boy who brought his five loaves and two fish? We bring what we have. What gift God has given you, what par some parcel of love you've got hidden inside there somewhere, some thing you can bring, you've got it. And you give it, and you express it, and Jesus multiplies it the way he did with the two loaves and fishes. So that our watching world around us sees from us some glimpses of Jesus. That's it. I began by saying in this sermon that I didn't really care for the word repent. It's, it's a very important word, even if I don't like it. But the word I do like, the word I do like, that admirable, admirable word is compassion. 
Don't you like it? Amen. The act.
most amazing of all is this, that you call us to be your partners in this world, to take and use ourselves and our gifts to bless others. So take us and our gifts this day, and in your wisdom weave them into your holy purposes, through Jesus Christ our Lord. support us, you guide us. Your word gives us wisdom and helps us to live as we ought. We thank you today for all the ways you lead us with such patience that we think of others who have been an example to us of Christian life and faith. We thank you for the community of the church and this church. We thank you for the encouragement of your spirit speaking through your word. We thank you most of all for Jesus, tested and tried as we are, yet faithful to the end. Lord God, we have the great privilege of coming to you, but also bringing others to you in prayer. As we pray for a wayward world where your will is so regularly set aside by those who seek to impose their own will. And so we pray for those who are threatened by the power of others. And we think especially today, perhaps we've forgotten about the people, Rohingya people, displaced from Myanmar, living in a million of them in a refugee camp. We pray for those threatened by hunger and poverty and chaos in Haiti. We pray for those whose future has been stolen from them in so many ways by neglect or abuse. Lord, we pray for the church worldwide, where it is strong, make it compassionate. Where it is weak, make it strong. Where it is joyful, help it to remember those who are sorrowful. And where it is sad, give it fresh joy. We pray for our own Presbyterian Church across the country. Make those congregations that are strong, strengthen them further, and lift up those who are struggling. And we pray for our own congregation. We thank you for your presence in our midst. Help us more and more to acknowledge you as Lord of our lives and leader of our congregation. Lord, over the summer months, continue to care for those around us, those we know who are housebound, those who know we were grieving. Help us to welcome others into our community life here at St Andrews who join us on Sunday. And we pray too for the August gatherings, that they may be occasions of beauty and joy and life and grace. Finally, we pray for ourselves. Lord, you know us through and through. You know the doubts that plague us, the hurts that have not gone away, the fears that haunt us at night time, the envy that robs us of peace, the hopes that rise but too often fall away. God of all compassion, walk with us in this new week. Be our teacher and guide, our healer and our helper. Through Jesus Christ. He taught us when we pray to say, Our, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory. 
Our final hymn is 314, God is love, come heaven adore. Thank you. 